What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. Happy 2024. I am really excited to bring today's video to you. It's going to be a really interesting one, I think. With it being the new year, many of us, myself included, are going to be doing dry January. This is just a great way to rebalance your relationship with alcohol and just kind of get a little bit of a, a healthy start to the new year and hopefully undo some of the damage that we did over the holidays. The first time I did dry January was last year and I felt great after it and I even lost a little bit of weight. So I'm doing it again this year, but with a little bit more attention on exploring some of the ways that I can still brew beer, uh, but still have uh, a true dry January. And the best way to do that is to explore the vein of brewing non-alcoholic beers. And so ever since Homebrew Con of last year, I got really, really interested in the idea of making non-alcoholic beer that actually tasted really good. Um, I do believe it's possible considering I've had plenty of examples that other people have made that have been fantastic non-alcoholic beers that tasted just as good as anything with four or 5% alcohol in it. What I'll be doing today is a non-enzymatic hot mash, where I will be actually conducting my mash at 175 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very, very high. This temperature is above mash out temperatures for your standard all grain batch. By doing this short high temperature mash, you are indeed still breaking down a little bit of that starch, you're getting a little bit of sugar out of it, and you're getting the flavor that you need and the color that you need from the grains. You don't want to go too long on this mash because you do risk getting a very tannic kind of uh, character in the beer. I'm choosing this particular method because I believe it is the least time intensive and the least resource intensive uh, method of making this beer. There is one big thing you must pay attention to though, and it's a safety concern, so please listen. Because there's really a low level of alcohol in the beer and because the IBUs are generally pretty low, you really increase the risk of pathogens living in the beer and not being killed off or prevented to grow from the hops and the alcohol levels. The best defense at this point against foodborne illness in the case of a non-alcoholic beer is to keep the pH of your beer below 3.9. There is a very easy way to get that pH where you need it to be by just adding a hefty amount of acidulated malt into your grist, but I do implore you, please, before you pitch your yeast into your fermenter, just take a quick pH measurement of that wort. If you have a pH of 3.9 or less in your final beer, you should be safe to actually keep that beer around for a long time as long as it's properly packaged. Now, in my experience, non-alcoholic beer has always tasted either one of two things. It either tastes watery and thin, or it tastes like just unfermented beer, like it's worty. Um, and it tastes like instead of going into the fermenter and throwing yeast at it, you just put it right into a bottle. Um, not the best flavor in the world in either case. So I want to try and figure out what it is that we can do to prevent either of those issues from happening. My thoughts are that I can prevent the watery character by adding a lot of starchy kind of grains in there. Some stuff like flaked oats, flaked wheat, a lot of adjuncts to really build up the body in the beer. I think if I can help get a little bit more body into the beer by doing this, it's going to make a big difference with the way it's perceived. To prevent that kind of wordy character, I'm actually going to uh, elect to not really use too much specialty grain in here at all. I think that toasted and kilned malts are really going to add a lot more of that kind of wordy character in, and that's not really going to be very good for the final product. So the less of that that I use, I think the better off we're going to be in that department. And then finally, I think picking the style of beer makes the biggest difference too. I'm going to be making a non-alcoholic wit beer, which means that a lot of that flavor is actually going to come from spices. So adding in the orange peel and the coriander is going to make a big difference in terms, I think, of covering up some of that classic non-alcoholic beer flavor. Hopefully we'll get a decent amount of flavor from the yeast as well, but um, I'm not sure exactly how that's going to turn out. And also, if you want to cover things up with hops as well, feel free to, but just keep in mind, you want to keep your IBUs from getting too high. A high level of IBUs for a non-alcoholic beer is like 20 to 30 IBUs. It's really, really easy to get your bitterness to gravity ratio to go way overboard um, with just a very small bittering addition. So um, keep that in mind as you are using hops to kind of add flavor to your beer. Before we jump into that recipe though, I want to thank a couple organizations for helping make the video possible. Firstly, Northern Brewer, they provided the ingredients for this batch of beer. Um, really easy to find the stuff that you need on their website, so check them out for that. Secondly, Clawhammer Supply, who manufacture the system I'll be using for today's brew. Um, I'm be using their 10 gallon 240 volt system because I'm going for such a low original gravity The grist on this beer is really really small as a result of this being a really really small grist And also as a result of the high mash temperature, we're gonna see reduced efficiency So when you're plugging in your recipe into something like Brewfather, if you're using brewing software Try to dial that efficiency expectation back. So instead of my normal 75% brew house efficiency I went with about a 
60 to 65 percent brew house efficiency for planning this recipe and it worked. My grist is only three and a quarter pounds for a five gallon batch. That gets us an original gravity, original gravity, somewhere around 10, 13. This is the final gravity of a good number of beers. The final gravity in this we're expecting to actually only be a few points lower, about 10, 10. If all of this works out properly, then I will have a beer that is about one half of 1% alcohol, which is actually FDA approved non-alcoholic beer. So we start out with one and a quarter pounds of Dingemann's Belgian Pilsner malt. And we're gonna add to this one and a quarter pounds of Thomas Fawcett Torrified Wheat. Torrified wheat is basically unmalted wheat, which you would use uh, normally for a wit beer, but this adds a lot of nice body and fullness to the mouthfeel. On top of that, we're gonna kind of double down on that, uh, that body and that wheat addition by adding in half a pound of flaked wheat as well. And then lastly, we're gonna add a quarter pound of acidulated malt to the whole thing. This is 7.7% .7 of the grist acidulated malt. It will significantly drop the pH and we want that. This is going to be a well below your standard mash pH kind of beer. Um, so I'm not even gonna bother measuring the pH during the mash because I just know it's going to be really, really low. For hops in this one, I'm gonna be using half an ounce of sots at 30 minutes to uh, bitter with. This is a 30 minute boil. We don't want that boil to go too long because then we start to increase the original gravity of the beer. Um, so 30 minutes is more than sufficient. Then we're gonna do half an ounce of Styrian Goldings at five minutes in order to really bring in a little bit of nice classic whipped beer flavor from the hops. This overall should give us about seven IBUs. We really don't wanna go overboard in the IBUs, again, because it's really, really easy to over bitter these beers. For the yeast on this beer, I'm going to be using Lalamand Wit, which is a simple dry yeast strain uh, that gets you the wit beer character. So we'll see how that goes. For the water in this beer, the water profile I'm targeting is 75 parts per million of calcium, 8 parts per million of magnesium, 8 parts per million of sodium, 102 parts per million of chloride, 78 parts per million of sulfate, and 16 parts per million of bicarbonates. Because I'm actually only gonna be using such a small grain bill and because I have such a short mash and a short boil, it's actually only about six and a half gallons of overall reverse osmosis water I'm starting with. So to get that water profile, I'm adding to that six and a half gallons of water, five grams of calcium chloride, two grams of Epsom, and two grams of gypsum. And lastly, because this is a wit beer, we have a spice addition in here. Because the spices are such an integral part in the flavor of this beer, and because I think they're gonna help cover up some of the non-alcoholic character of the beer, um, I'm gonna go ahead and just keep the standard level of spices that I would use on any other five gallon batch. Uh, so we're gonna be using five grams of coriander and five grams uh, of orange zest going into the last five minutes of the boil. Five grams is kind of an estimation, but I would just zest an entire orange to get the uh, results that you need. And lastly, for the mash of this one, it's a hot mash for a very short period of time. We'll be mashing at 175 degrees for about 30 minutes. There's no mash out step there, so once the mash is complete, I'll just pull the grain basket out and we'll start heating up to our short boil as well. This is unlike anything I've ever done before, so it really should be interesting to see how this turns out, but um, I'm hoping that it works out well. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump to the brew day. So I started out by adding eight gallons of reverse osmosis water into my 10 gallon 240 volt claw hammer supply system and started to heat that up to the mash temperature of 175. While I was waiting for the water to heat up, I milled out my grain and I added my water salts into the water. Once I had reached the target mash temperature, I mashed in with the entire tiny grain bill and distributed it thoroughly. Um, it, this mash was indeed incredibly thin and uh, very, very lightly colored. Once that 30 minute mash was complete, I just pulled out the grain basket. Uh, there's no sense in doing a mash out because you're already above mash out temperatures anyway. And I let the grain basket drain for about 15 minutes. Once that grain basket was completed with draining, I moved on to the boil. And at that 30 minute mark, the top of the boil, I added my half an ounce of sats. I let the boil continue for about 25 minutes before adding in a half an ounce of Styrian Goldings at five minutes, as well as my spices, the five grams of coriander and the peel of one whole orange. Five minutes later, I ended the boil and I did a quick whirlpool to coagulate everything together and then chilled and transferred into my anvil bucket fermenter. I pulled an OG reading at this time, found the OG to be a uh, meager 1013, but uh, I was actually exactly on target. Um, and then I pitched my yeast and left it to ferment. So for the fermentation on this beer, it's really important that we think about this 
Uh, not as if it was a standard beer. Critical to the success of this beer is actually making sure that you don't let the yeast ferment this too far. Because of the really small original gravity, you're still going to have a very fast fermentation. And it is entirely possible for standard yeast to still chew through all of the sugar in that beer and leave you with a very dry final gravity, uh, which could leave you still with like a one or 2% ABV beer, which is then exceedingly dry as well. So you have a flavorless beer at the end of the day if you do it like this. So it's very important to actually Actually stop that fermentation early. It's known as arrested fermentation and it's a technique that's used in almost all fermented non-alcoholic beers. If you stop that fermentation early then you could guarantee that there's still going to be some sugar left over in that beer to still help provide that residual mouthfeel and body and beer flavor. So generally you're going to want to take a gravity measurement of your fermenting wort uh, roughly every single day until you have hit that particular ABV level that you want which is in most cases less than half a percent alcohol uh, to really be called a non-alcoholic beer. Now you can use any standard brewer's yeast you'd want that you'd otherwise normally use in, in a standard beer to make a non-alcoholic beer with. You just have to pay attention, as I said, to that original gravity and stop that fermentation a little early just to guarantee things go the way you need them to. However, there are now yeasts that are available to home brewers uh, that are actually designed to be used in non-alcoholic beer production. Typically these yeasts are maltotriose negative and maltose negative. Maltose being the primary fermentable sugar that is in beer. These types of yeast strains are popping up a lot more frequently now, but the ones I'd really recommend you check out are Fermentis LA01, if you can find that one, Lalaman Lona, or WLP618. Even if you're using these strains, the same exact brewing practices still apply, so just keep that all in mind. There's really not that much else to talk about when it comes to the fermentation though, so just to recap, uh, basically what we'll be doing is pitching in one packet of Lalamand Wit, and I'll be checking the fermentation every single day, and when I start to reach about 1010 to 1009, then I'm gonna stop that fermentation by cold crashing or by transferring into my keg and then getting that really cold to force carbonate. This should happen really in about three to five days, if everything goes right. One thing to really pay attention to though is that these beers really favor themselves for brewers that use kegs to package their beer versus bottlers. Typically when you use priming sugar to bottle a beer and, and bottle condition and carbonate it in the bottle, you're actually adding about half a percent ABV to it. So if you're really truly trying to make a non-alcoholic beer um, and you're trying to really ascribe that half a percent number in your bottle conditioning, it's not really going to be possible. That being said, it's homebrew, so who really cares if it's half a percent or if it's one percent as long as you're not selling it it's not regulated by the FDA for home brewers or anything like that. So um, kind of up to you as to how seriously you want to take that number. Um, but if you really want to be a hardliner on that half a percent alcohol or less, uh, really kegging in and force carbonating is really the way to go for these beers. Hopefully though in a few days we have a pretty good tasting non-alcoholic beer on tap. So I will catch you guys then. The fermentation for this beer was interesting. Um, it, it took a little bit longer than anticipated to reach that final gravity of 10.08. Took about six days, um, but overall still a relatively fast fermentation. Once I confirmed that final gravity of 10.08, I transferred into a keg and force carbonated and got it ready to serve right away. So I did actually have some packaging issues with this beer. I had a little bit of a sulfur problem early on because of the arrested fermentation. So that just required letting the beer uh, stay cold and off gas a lot of that sulfur so just burping the keg a couple times with uh, some co2 in the back and i also found that the spice flavor was not where i wanted it to be uh, it was lacking a lot of orange character so i made a tincture with some orange peel and added uh, that tincture into the keg as well that shouldn't really affect the alcohol level but um, i'm sure no one really cares because it's homebrew So the beer is called Little Weedy, and it comes in at 0.5% ABV or 0.7% ABV, depending on which calculation formula you're using, um, and it has about 7 IBUs in it. For the appearance of the beer, it pours with a really nice pale straw color uh, with a little bit of haze in there as well, which really makes it shine nicely when it picks up a little bit of light. But overall, a very, very pale beer. Uh, it has a really, really great head on it uh, and fantastic head retention with great fluffiness and good structure, thanks to all that wheat in there. Um, and this is actually not characteristic for non-alcoholic beers. Typically, the head retention is awful on a non-alcoholic beer. So I'm very proud of the fact that I was able to get a uh, reasonably good-looking beer out of this. All right, so now let's go in for aroma. 
So the aroma I'm getting off this beer is definitely dominated by the coriander. Um, it's a lot of like that kind of character, uh, gentle herbalness, uh, and then definitely getting a little bit of like a weedy character as well. Um, not getting your classic kind of wit beer spice though. The aroma on this one is definitely a little bit different than a standard wit beer, um, but we'll talk more about that later. Let's go in for the mouthfeel now. So, this is what I'm happy about here. Mouthfeel on this beer actually is medium bodied. The watery character that you sometimes get out of a non-alcoholic beer is not there. The beer honestly feels like a standard four to five percent beer, um, and it has that classic soft, very fairy pillowy kind of wit beer uh, character as well in the mouth. The, the carbonation is rather high as well, um, which really does kind of help accentuate some of those details. I'm really, really happy with the fact that I didn't have a watery mouth feel in this. So now let's go in for flavor. The flavor on this is light, quite light. While there is certainly not a worty character to this at all whatsoever, this tastes like a fermented beer. The Depth of flavor is quite, quite shallow. <laughs> it's similar to drinking like a Bud Light in that there's not all that much flavor there. Um, but what is there, unlike a Bud Light, is actually pretty good. Above anything else, I think the biggest thing I get besides the spices is that wheat character. Um, it's coming across in a beer-like way, but it's definitely trending towards the doughy pattern of uh, flavors as opposed to the more bready or uh, malty specifically. There is definitely a nice increased orange presence in this after I had the tincture. Um, and the coriander really is taking the center stage in here in terms of the spices. But what's missing from this is really what makes it a wit beer, and it's the yeast expression. There is actually no yeast expression in this at all. It is, um, and that makes it kind of bland, unfortunately. It is missing the classic wit beer spice. There really is no substitute for that. You have to have the yeast uh, give off its classic esters and phenols to get that quintessential whip beer character. And with the really, really low original gravity of this beer, unfortunately, I don't think it had that much to work with and was not able to produce uh, really any expressive character at all. So that's kind of disappointing in terms of what I was expecting. That being said, there is an acceptable amount of flavor in this beer, I think, overall. There is a balanced bitterness to it as well. Honestly, non-alcoholic beers that are hopped pretty heavily um, actually have a different kind of bitterness to them than fully fermented beers that have been hopped pretty heavily. If you've ever tasted like a really heavily bittered IPA wort before uh, fermenting it, that's the kind of bitterness I'm talking about. That's not here, obviously, because we only use seven IBUs, but there is a balanced bitterness there, enough to kind of counteract some of the sweeter doughiness of this. Um, so I'm happy about that, but I am missing hop flavor from this. There's no Styrian Golding's flavor, uh, which I was really hoping would come through. So the pH on this beer is like 3.8, um, which is pretty low. That being said, the pH in this is not translating directly to like sourness. Um, there is a little bit of a tartness to it, but it's not anything like that would be different from any other wheat-based beer. I think the tartness is actually coming from the wheat. So while the pH in this doesn't really directly contribute to sourness, what it does do is uh, limit the amount of flavor that can be involved. That's one of the reasons why it's a little bit more bland than most uh, other non-alcoholic beers, I think, is because the pH is so much lower than other non-alcoholic beers. Being my very first non-alcoholic brew, I'm actually still really happy with the way things turned out overall, even if the beer isn't perfect. I'm happy I managed to avoid the watery character you can sometimes get and that worty flavor um, that you can sometimes get as well. Neither of those things is present in this beer. As a trade-off, it's missing some other flavors that I would have liked. Um, but, so at the end of the day, maybe like a three out of five or something like that. It's not the worst beer in the world, definitely not the worst one I've ever made. Um, is it my favorite non-alcoholic beer of all time? Absolutely not. That being said, it is kind of a nice refreshing alternative to the fridge full of athletic beers that I have downstairs. While the beers from Athletic Brewing have a lot more flavor than this, they do have that wordy characteristic and I pick up on it on every single one of theirs I try. So it is nice to have something that doesn't have that characteristic on tap. Plus, it's a lot of fun to still be able to brew beer and drink it during dry January. As far as potential improvements for this beer go, I've got a little bit of a list here. I think the first thing I might do is try to add in some more interesting flavor malts in there, potentially some Munich malts. I know that would darken the color of the beer, but with the small grain bill, you're gonna get a very pale uh, beer anyway. 
that might add a little bit more of that breadiness I'm looking for. Um, maybe dial back a little bit on the wheat. While it did provide a nice haze and really, really good head structure, um, I think it contributed significantly to a lot of doughy character. I would definitely increase the orange peel that is put in during the end of the boil. Coriander is perfectly adequate. Um, and then, yeah, I think on top of that, I would probably raise the OG and arrest the fermentation a little bit uh, higher up. So you're looking at more of like maybe an OG of 1020 with a final gravity of 1015. If you can do something like that, that might get the job done with a little bit more flavor involved. Another thing you could experiment with is using one of the dedicated low or no alcohol yeasts to try and actually get the job done that way. Um, I think the next time I brew a non-alcoholic beer though, instead of doing the hot mash with very, very small grain bill, I think I'm gonna do a cold non-enzymatic mash next time and see if that does anything differently and if I like the results any better. So uh, stay tuned for that. It'll be coming soon after this video. Anyway guys, I hope you learned something and enjoyed this video. This was completely uncharted territory for me, so it was really fun to explore something brand new um, and to share my experience with you guys. I hope it was valuable for you if you're trying to brew your own non-alcoholic beer. If it was, please go ahead, hit that like button and subscribe as well because I do plenty of other kinds of beer styles, including ones that are actually full alcohol. Comment down below, let me know your thoughts. Have you made uh, non-alcoholic beer before? And if you did, how did you go about doing it? And what kind of beer was it? Uh, because I think that makes a big difference too in terms of how that beer comes across. If you want to support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one. There's plenty of other designs as well in my merchandise store. You can find that in the description box. I also have a Patreon. My Patreon supporters are instrumental in upgrading the production quality of my channel year over year, and then just helping me to get some cool stuff to play around with that provides some really interesting content to you guys. If Patreon's not your thing though, I also have channel memberships and there's also the super thanks button if you want to hit either of those things. They really help me out quite a bit as well. There is an Amazon store I have in the description box as well where you can find all of my recommended brewing equipment and accessories as well as my camera stuff. If it's available on Amazon and I like using it, it's going to be on that store. So do check that out if you're in the market for some new gear. If you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also active on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer. So check those links out for some more frequent content updates. And last but certainly not least, if you're still here, thank you very much for watching all the way to the end of the video. I apologize for the recent dry spell with content, but I have been taking some time to spend time with my family and enjoy the holidays. Uh, but there is a lot of really exciting content coming soon, and um, I'm really excited to get some more of it put out there. So until the next one, this one goes out to you guys who are still watching, and I'll see you in the next one. So until then, cheers. Yeah.